Acts chapter 20, if you have your Bibles there while you're getting there, I want to remind you and just to give a quick thank you, Kevin Bartriff, who's been a member of our church for many years, his dad died up in the Pacific Northwest, and he's been there for a funeral, and he asked me specifically, would you please thank the church family and so many of his friends who had tried to lift them up and encourage them during this difficult time of his dad's uh, transition. So please pray for Kevin and Soledad, if you would please. I wanted to make sure you knew about that and forgotten to. Acts chapter 20, how many were here this morning? Would you raise your hand you, so you know kind of what we're doing? How many were not able to be in this room this morning? Would you raise your hand? Okay, so I, I just got to figure so many are not necessarily here on a Sunday morning because of other responsibilities. This morning we spoke on the topic of finishing your course well and finishing it with joy. The Apostle Paul has uh, now finished his third missionary journey. He's making way back to Jerusalem, he is with seven men that he had led to Christ and trained for the ministry, who each of them had money on their person that they were taking back with a testimony and fun funds to encourage the saints of Jerusalem to be distributed among those hurting people there. Paul always had a heart for the Jews everywhere, but especially in Jerusalem. Wonder why he had that heart for them because he had hurt them so bad. When he says, I'm the chiefest of sinners, I'm sure his mind went back to watching Mrs. Stephen cry and the kids scream as her dad was being killed. Going into places and just hailing men and women and with soldiers and with police officers saying, take him to jail and kids screaming and wives crying. It doesn't matter. Don't put up with their crying. Just take them. And the only reason he did that is because they were Christians because they were saved, because they proclaimed the word of God and Jesus as their savior, and he was after it. And of course, he met Jesus. He was no match for Jesus. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad? And he found out who he was, and then he asked him, what does he want me to do? So that's a beautiful thing. Once you find out who Jesus is and he's your savior, the next thing you ought to do is ask him, what do you want me to do? And he did, and God used him in a supernatural way, but he has on his heart a passion. He's got a time clock clicking in his mind. I want to get to Jerusalem by Passover so I can let all these seven men, Sopater and Segundus and Aristarchus and Timothy and the other names you can read in Acts chapter 20. He goes, I want to get all these guys and I want them to tell their testimony to the church at Jerusalem and then give their finances, and the offerings they've been collecting over a year's time. Remember, it started in, in, in Corinth. He went to Corinth first and said, hey, if you guys will participate, how much will you give? And they told him, and then that was our, that's our method for faith promise missions. What he did is what we do. We say, how much will you give this year, every week? And that's why he said, upon the first day of the week, let every man lay by in stores, God has prospered them, so that they can have the money every week, and they'll put it together, and then at the end of the year, they were going to take it down to them. We don't have to do that. We can send it by wires and transfers and checks to different places. But uh, he challenged them to do that. And so the church of Corinth, then he went to other churches in Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, so forth and so on. And he challenged them to get involved with the program. And they were much poorer, much more afflicted, but they, they, they participated. They begged for the opportunity to participate in this. And now, uh, a year has gone by, he has collected the funds, now there are seven men traveling with him, and they find themselves in a city called Miletus. Miletus is a port city, it's about 30 miles from Ephesus, and he calls for the Ephesian elders. That's the pastors of the churches there in that city of Ephesus. And while he was there, he trained for three years in the school of Tyrannus, we've talked about that already, but he trained every day and pastors. And by the way, that's what missionaries should do. That's what I should do. That's what you should do. Bus captains, recruit other bus workers. Nursery workers, encourage other ladies to join you in the nursery. Sunday school teachers, make Sunday school teachers. Choir members, produce choir members. Orchestra members, find other orchestra members. People that learn to play the piano, teach other people to play the piano. Someone who's a preacher, help others learn to preach. If you're a missionary, you ought to be praying for more missionaries. It's just what we ought to do. We're no success without successors. Keep, keep working. Keep asking the Lord to help you with that. And he spent time. It wasn't easy. He tells about his time. We read about that. He said, you knew. I was with you in all season. 
when I had tears and fears and the lying away of the Jews, and he tells them, he rehearses them. He says, would you guys come from Ephesus, come to Miletus? And he stood and looked them in the eyes on the shore there outside the boat he was getting ready to get on. And he says, I'm not going to see. This is the last time I'm going to be, be anywhere near you. You're not going to see this face anymore. So listen to me. And he says, you remember how it was when I was with you? How the, I went through a lot of hard times and you went through some of those with me. You know how that I was faithful to give the gospel out to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I, I, did, I wasn't a respecter. I gave the gospel out. He said, I kept back nothing that was profitable to you. If it helped you, I gave it to you. And I, want, I, I taught you publicly in church and I taught you in your homes. I discipled you one-on-one, -on -one, house to house, wherever your home was. I went there and I taught you publicly. I held back nothing. He says, now I'm going back to Jerusalem, and I do not know exactly what's in front of me. But I do know the Spirit of God witnesses to me and, and, and reminds me, in every city you go to, you can expect bonds and afflictions. And I don't know about you, that doesn't sound very fun to me. Does it sound fun to you? Bonds, handcuffs, and trials. That's what's in your future, Paul. The Spirit of God told me, hey, Wherever I go, I'm going to have handcuffs and I'm going to have afflictions. But then he gives this classic statement in verse 24. But none of these things move me. I am not going to be bothered by that. It doesn't keep me from doing what God's called me to do. I, mean, I tell you, every one of us need to have that determination inside of us. I'm going to finish strong. I want to finish my course with joy. And the ministry that God gave me to do. You know why you're here if you're after your Savior? You're here for ministry. You're not here to, to accumulate a bunch of wealth to leave with your grandkids and your kids. You're not here to, big, the bigger, to have the biggest and the best and the most toys. You're here for ministry. And you say, well, Pastor, you're here for ministry. You're a pastor. No, all of us are ministers. Every member is a minister. Every saint is a servant. And he says here, I don't care what's happened in front of me. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know it's not always going to be pretty. But it's not going to move me from what God called me to do. And let me just say, you should not let pride, and the reason we don't do what God wants to do sometimes is because we're too self-centered. He said, the reason it doesn't move me is because I don't consider my life dear to myself. I'm not here to get all I can, can all I get, sit on my can, and tell everybody how much I have in my can. I'm not here to try to make myself comfortable, happy, or convenient. Now, that's a battle. I had that battle. You probably do, too. Some of us, we live in the, in the wonderful United States of America, and we're nervous about a recession. We'll live better in a recession than rich people will live in, in Congo, Africa. We'll have more to eat in, in, a, in a terrible recession. We'll have more liberties and more freedoms than most of the world will ever dream about having on our worst day. And we're all nervous about that. We're afraid about that. He said, look, I'm not worried about that because I don't really care. I'm not going to let pride move me. He said, I'm not going to let problems move me. Some of the reasons that there are empty seats in auditoriums here and elsewhere is because people hit a problem. There's a problem, there's an affliction, there's a difficulty. And rather than running to the Lord and continue being faithful to the Lord, they just exit, they transition out instead of transforming through. He said, I'm not going to let pride hinder me, I'm not going to let problems hinder me. He said, number two, three, I'm not going to let people hinder me. And by the way, Apostle Paul warned the Galatian folks, he said, look, you did run well, who did hinder you? And I'm not going to let people influence me. You better be careful who you're listening to. Young person, I, I thank God for podcasts, but some of them are garbage. Listen to some folks, he's got this in your ear. I don't know what you're listening to, but you better be careful what you listen to. I learned this week and was reminded here by Brother Caleb Garraway about in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number 2, where it talks about Lot and that how Lot seeing and hearing what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah vexed his soul. Seeing and what? You got to be careful what you see and what you hear. Because it will vex you. It will create all kinds of issues and it will weaken you to the place you can't even stand. I don't want that to happen for me and I don't want that to happen for you. You pray for me about that and I'll pray for you. 
want us to be strong Christians. But he now looks him in the eye and he says, you know what? I, I, none of those things are going to move me. The problems are not going to move me. The pride's not going to move me. The, the people are not going to move me because I don't count my life dear to myself. But here's what I want to do. I want to finish my course with joy. Every dad on Father's Day ought to have a goal. I want to finish my course with joy. I do not want to be a sourpuss when I'm old. Our senior, our senior friends here, listen, decide you're not going to be a grump. You're not going to model old age as though it's like it's really hard. I don't want servants of Christ. We don't have anything to complain about. God's been faithful to us. And we ought to have a spring in our step and a song in our heart, a smile on our face and say, hey, this is what God gave me to do. It's going to come with some good things and some bad things. But how are we going to finish our course with joy? Just a few days, all of us are going to stand before Jesus, the judgment seat of Christ. And you're going to give an account for you, and I'm going to give an account for me. But I have the opportunity, looks like to me, to give an account on a different level because I'm supposed to be watching for your souls. Brother, Brother Keith has got a, one of the more vibrant Sunday school classes in our church. He's watching for their souls. Every time he meets with the bus, the bus captains and workers over here, he's watching for their souls. He's trying to direct us and help us. We, we talk about VBS or talk about Transformer Kids Club and his arenas. He's trying to say, Lord, help me to help the First Baptist Church family think the way you think, feel the way you feel, and want what you want. We get up for friend day. We're not getting up for friend day for just to get another body in the building. We're trying to motivate every one of us to do what God wants us to do. How does God feel about the world? How does he think about the world? How does he think about your neighbors and your friends and the person next to you in the cubicle or the person across the way? Hey, how does he think about them? How does he feel about them? What does he want for them? That's what churches are to do. We come together so that God can reshape our souls. And I really want us to finish well. I want you to be glad you did and not wish you would have. I want that for me. I, maybe it's a little selfish, but listen, I want us, and I love this statement. I want you to say it with me. All of us, one more time, all of us, every one of us finishing strong our race. Well, what are some things that can help us to finish strong? We talked about two of them this morning. I want to share a couple more this evening. Number one, to finish strong, you need to stabilize your calling. Make sure you're saved and make sure you're surrendered. Saved and surrendered. Those are the happiest Christians who finish their course with joy. People that know they have Jesus and people that know that Jesus has them. You belong to God the moment you get saved. Now, the earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof. You were created by God. You must be born to His family. But when you're born, Jesus says in John chapter 10, He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. That's salvation. Do you know that God knows you? Because the Bible tells us, and I'm not here to scare anybody, just to remind you of a biblical truth. Many will say unto the Lord in that day, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord. I ran a bus route. I sang in the choir. I played an instrument. I did this and this and this. I gave. Check my giving record. I was, I did this. And they'll say, we have all these wonderful things in your name. And it seems to me the Lord Jesus will look at, at people like that and with a question mark and say, huh, depart from me. You workers of iniquity. On what basis would they have to be put into hell? Because I never knew you. What's more important, you knowing God or him knowing you? Him knowing you. I, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And the Bible says, hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. You know the best way to get to know God is obey him. I'm glad you're here tonight. The more obedience you give to God, the more that you're going to know him. And you, we, we short sheet ourselves and we limit our knowledge of God based upon our obedience to Him. So if I want to finish my course strong and with joy, and by the way, you want to be joyful as you finish. Number one, settle your, your calling. Make sure you know you're saved. It doesn't matter if I think you're saved or you think uh, someone else thinks you're saved. What matters is if you, does God in you, do you know, do you know Him? 
He know you. Excuse me, I should ask that first. Number two, we need to settle our offenses. If you've got bitterness, heart hurts unresolved inside, inside of your heart toward another human being, you're not going to finish your course with joy. You can go to your grave with a grudge, but you'll not finish with joy. Now, Daddy, Mama, Sister, Brother, don't make excuses why it's okay for you to validate a grudge. Well, if what happened to me happened to you, you would feel the way I do. It doesn't matter what I think or anyone else thinks. And you can get your stuff and put it out on Facebook and Instagram and all those things and make people feel bad for you because this happened to you. You know, some people, are just they just want a pound of flesh. They want someone to pay, and they're going to spend their entire existence trying to get someone to pay for something that Jesus has released them from. And yet they're holding some of us. You know the story in Matthew chapter 18, where a large, uh, a very wealthy man had many debtors. He said, look, it's time. I got to cut, cut my loss. I got to collect some of my, my debts. And one by one, he had some folks come. One guy came with 10,000 talents, the equivalent of maybe $13 million, $14 million in today's currency. He says, all right, pay up. He goes, you know, I don't have it right now, but if you'll just give me some time. He said, you don't have enough time or, or earning capacity. He's, he told his, his guards, said, just sell him. Sell him as a slave, sell his wife as a slave, sell his kids as a slave, and sell everything he has. I'll cut my losses. This guy's never going to be able to pay me. And the guy fell at his knees and said, please have mercy upon me. I will pay thee all. And the king says, no, no, you, you don't have that. But you know what? The king had compassion upon him. He said, look, forget it. You don't owe me anything. But that same joker left that room, went out and found a guy who owes him the equivalent of $800 to $1,000. Took him by the throat, said, hey, man, pay me what you owe me. And the guy said the exact same thing to him as he said to the king. He said, no, I'm not going to do it. Hey, where's the police? Get this guy. He owes me money. And they carted him off to jail until he screamed and hollered until his family brought enough money to him to pay it off. And the news went out, and they heard that he had been forgiven $13 million, and he holds this guy in jail for 1000 And they come back and tell the king and says, hey, man, you know the guy you let go for $13 million? He's got Joe in jail here for 1000 Says he owes him for 1000 And these guys are screaming and hollering, and they're trying to get his family to come bring him, bring him 1000 bucks. And it made the king mad. The king said, how dare you? You wicked you have been forgiven this much, and you're holding this guy by his throat? It makes me mad. It made the king mad, and it makes God mad. And then he said, you're going to be turned over the tormentors till you pay all 13 mil. I'll, just, I'll leave you to spend the rest of your life working this off. If that's what you're going to do, you're not going to forgive him. And then there's a story that says, so shall your heavenly, the last verse of Matthew 18, so shall your heavenly Father do to you if you do not from your heart. Well, I would forgive him if I felt like they were sincere. That's not the Bible method. If they were really sorry, I would forgive them. No, no, no. Whether they're sorry or not, whether they ask forgiveness or not, if you do not from your heart forgive, so shall your father. What's, what's the heavenly Father going to do? He's going to turn me over to torment. People who are bitter are tormented on the inside. They're getting eat up on the inside. They suffer health problems. They suffer mental health. They're focused. They're bitter. They're frustrated. They're fearful. Lots of things come because someone will not let go a past hurt. And you can hold on to it if you want to. You can keep that person that hurt you by the throat after you have asked God to forgive you of all your sins, and he did it. And you can hold them at bay, but we're going to be the loser. We're going to miss out on finishing our life with joy. You watch people that are bitter, I promise you, they don't finish with joy. And most people who are bitter don't want to admit they're bitter. No, I'm not bitter, I'm just a little frustrated. No, you're not, you're bitter. Admit it and quit it. You know, it's, just, it's just the way I was, and it hurt me so bad. I tell you, friend, you have a choice when you have conflict. 
you can accept it and make the person play, and you can, you can exercise vengeance and make sure you wait. I was talking to someone this week, and it just, something happened 18 years ago. 18 years ago, it probably wasn't handled the best, but now they're forcing the person to either go to court or give a public apology in this way and admitting of all their wrongs so I can move on. I need you to publicly apologize for all that you did to me. And, this, and they're just they're giving thing after thing the other person has to do to, to, so they can move on. Now, I'm not a, I think it's good for other people to confess, but that does not happen for me to forgive. No one has to do anything for me to forgive in our hearts. By the way, how many sins of the world has God forgiven? He's the, he's the propitiation not only for our sins, but for the sins of the? Everybody's forgiven. They always cash in on forgiveness. God's forgiven them. And we pick and choose. And, and you can do it. But you're going to short cheat yourself and the ministry that God's called you to do. And, the way, and you'll forfeit ending your course with joy. I don't care if you're 14 or 81. You can hurt your future and your judgment seat by not settling your offenses. Number three, stand your biblical position. You want to finish your course with joy, stabilize your calling, settle your offenses, and stand your biblical position both practically and doctrinally. One of the things the Apostle Paul challenged his young men, Timothy and Titus in particular, was not hold fast that form of doctrine. Keep your doctrine clean. Keep it sound. Keep it clean. Hygiene is the word that is used for the word sound. Keep it clean. Don't swerve doctrinally. And now listen, I, I, I just remind you, I don't think everything that's been preached here behind this pulpit by me or anybody else is 100% flawless. I have said things here that, in hindsight, I said, man, that was, that was dumb. I shouldn't have said that. I don't, I don't think that was really right. I've messed up. Other people have messed up. But one thing is a passion with me. I want to try to be right as God is right. I want to be pure and true to the Bible. And you do as well. Because doctrinal error is a swerve on one person's part and a shipwreck that hurts a lot of people after that. On the other day, I think Brother Gibbs told me if they did a survey, 8% of the churches in America have a Sunday night service. That's not 8% of independent Baptist churches, but 8% of the churches in America have a Sunday evening gathering. And I find it, I had, I had someone the other traveling the other day, and they said, Pastor, I couldn't believe it. It took us to go to four churches to find a Sunday night service in the city we stopped to go to church in. Went to three independent Baptists who said they have a Sunday service, no Sunday night service. Went to a fourth one, and boy, how God blessed us. Boy, sad. But, you know, we need an emphasis on, on truth. By the way, you ought to know. If I ask you today, could you give us, just stand where you are and give us three verses on eternal security, how I can know for sure that I'll never lose myself. Could you give us that? How about three verses on why I should get baptized after I'm saved? Could you, could you stand right now and give us that? I said, some of you could. Some of you are scared to death. But we need to be doctrinally pure and find out why we believe, why we believe it. It's not just because Pastor Wilkerson believes it, not just because our church always believes that. Girls, why is it right for you to dress modestly and with distinction? If you don't understand why it is, as soon as you get out of the outskirts of a, of a church that has a little bit of a, of, of, of a DNA on that, you just go do what you want to do. If you don't think alcohol should not be in, in, ingested by Christian people, uh, then as soon as you get a little bit of freedom, then you're going to do that. If you don't think there are certain sexual zones of your body that should be covered up and should be not accentuated, then whenever you're on your own, you just do what you want to do. If you don't understand why to do it. But I, I find that there's a blessing that comes when I see people who have been doing the right thing the right way for the right reason for a lifetime. There's something that happens inside of me, and probably it's wrong, but I get really gut-punched and disappointed when I see people who preach, who live such a way, and now they're as squirrely as they can be. 
They're posting things they shouldn't post. I, I remember preaching for a man uh, several years ago, and man, he was such a dynamite preacher. I feel like he was a great soul winner. But boy, something went wrong. I saw him holding a drink, an alcoholic drink, congratulating his mother at a bar for a birthday gathering. I thought, I can't believe this is the same guy. It disappoints me terribly. And I love that guy, and I'll spend eternity with him. I feel confident he's saved. However, I promise you, he's not living a joy-filled life. He's not going to finish his course with joy. And I'm not saying that to be judgmental, not like I'm better than anybody else, or you're better than anybody else. But there ought to be a, a decide. You know what God wants for us? He wants us to stand. You don't, you're going to get knocked in your backside from time to time, but God's will for you is to stand. Let's look at that passage in Ephesians chapter 6, can we please? Thank you for listening. Thank you for following along. Ephesians chapter 6. Let's turn there. Let's hear the Bible's turn. Ephesians chapter 6. I want you to look, if, if you would please, verse number 11. Ephesians 6, 11. How many already have it? Would you raise your hand? You got it? How many are still looking for it? Don't put your hand up. Just keep finding it, Okay. There we go. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 11. I love you, church. Thank you for being here on Sunday night's amazing, sweet group of people. Verse 11. Read it with me, would you please? Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to. So why does he want us to put on the whole armor of God here in this verse? So we can stand. Would you look at verse 13? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand. When? Think there's an evil day going on right now? Sure. He said, I want you to stand. I want you to stand up strong. Take the shots of the world and stand. It might knock you back a little bit, might not, might, but I want you to stand. I want you to withstand the evil day. And then look at, on verse 13, and having done all, what? He said, I want you to stand. Anybody get the picture here? Look at the next verse, verse 14. What's the first word you see? Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with what? And having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and having done, having all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching whereunto to all perseverance, continue on, supplication of all the saints. For as for me, the, in, that utterance might be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mysteries of the gospel." I just make that, that point to you this evening, is that God wants you to stand. Mama, grandma, grandpa, dad, teenager, look, don't, don't be, the Bible tells us until you all come to the fullness of stature, and not be like little children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. But understand, what does the Bible say? You want to finish your course strong, stabilize your calling, settle your offenses, and Decide, you know what, I am going to stand doctrinally and practically pure. God wants that for us. Number four, sweeten your spirit. You know, I feel like that one thing this world cannot get their head around, and that is a joyful Christian. Wherever you go, doesn't mean you have to fake it. But I tell you, there ought to be an, a natural joy and sweeten your spirit. Smile. When other things are going, going, going crazy around you, you got a God, you got an inside track on future events. Are we surprised that things are going to get a little squirrely out there? No. We already know it. Evil men are going to wax worse and worse, deceiving and, by the way, be careful spending too much time catching up on all the news. Here's another suggestion I want to give you, church family. I want you to think about this. You know this verse. I think you'll be able to help me finish it. Listen, even the children probably should know this verse. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy... Okay, so the first thing he says, and of course that's where is success. But here's he said, he said, I don't want you to stop talking about the Bible. Can I give you a little bit of a challenge here? This week, why don't you decide, when I meet my friend who is a Christian, I'm going to talk about the Bible. I'm going to share with them a thought about the Scriptures, or I'm going to ask them to share with me a thought about the Scriptures. 
It's going to be 99 degrees this week. Oh, how about that? 96, 99. Hey, yesterday, 68. Unbelievable. And you know, the truth of the matter is I shouldn't be complaining about that, but here's what I should do. And there's nothing wrong to talk about how, wick, how crazy this world This world's just going crazy. But God's people ought to focus on that real quick and say, isn't it wonderful that people can be saved? Hey, what verse are you thinking about? Can I challenge you this week? Why don't you have a verse on your heart? If I ask you or you ask me, I want to be able to tell you one. Let's talk about the Bible. Amen. There is great blessing in doing that. And I think I will find here that will sweeten our spirit. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 55, I'm thinking about talking about that a little bit this week on, on Grace to Grow. But the fact that the, he said, just like the rain and the snow come down from heaven, they waters the earth and cause it to bring forth in bud. So we have seed for next year's sowing out on the field. And then we have, uh, we have food for this year's eating. He says, so shall my word be. Where does the word of God come from? It comes from heaven. And it lands inside of us and it, it will not return void. But what it will cause, it will cause joy and peace and singing. The products of a Bible-based person is going to be joy. Do you have joy? Can't buy it at Walmart. Can't get it at Sam's Club or Costco. But you'll get it by a relationship with the Bible. And peace. And, he says, singing. Singing is an outbreak of someone who has a relationship with the Scriptures. Just remind you, you're commanded to sing. If you're a child of God, you're commanded to sing. Pastor, I, you don't want to hear me sing. God does. There's even a whole song about it. God wants to hear you sing. <laughs> yeah, he wants to hear you sing. He wants to hear you. And by the way, you get a relationship with the Bible, you're going to find that songs will going to come to you. It won't be a have to, it'll be a get to. Joy will be there. Sweet in your spirit. When I was a kid, they used to sing this song, You Can Smile When You Can't Say a Word. You ever heard that song before? It goes like this. You can smile when you can't say a word. You can smile when you cannot be heard. You can smile when it's cloudy or fair. You can smile anytime, anywhere. Let's sing it with me, okay? But you've got to start off with a frown, okay? Do not smile. Here we go. You can smile when you can't say a word. You can Smile when you cannot be heard. You can smile when it's cloudy or fair. You can smile anytime, anywhere. Now we're going to do it again. We're not going to say smile. We're just going to smile. You ready? Here we go. You can. When you can't say a word, you can. When you cannot be heard, you can. When it's cloudy or fair, you can. Anytime, anywhere. You know, friends, if you want to sweeten your spirit, it's up to you. Get a relationship with the Word of God and let Him sweeten your spirit. Hey, Pastor, what are we talking about? We're talking about finishing life with joy. Amen. Stabilize your calling. Settle your offenses. Stand your biblical position. Find out where the Bible is and stand where the Bible is and sweeten your spirit. I'll also encourage you to sustain your purity. I hate to even talk about this, but it goes to my mind because greater men than us and greater people than us have train wrecked because of immorality. I don't know if there's someone in here that's just in hair's breadth from messing up, asking someone to send a photo that's immoral and inappropriate, sick. That's impurity. Searching the web for something that will challenge you physically. It's sin. We should not even speak of those things which are done of them in secret. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the works of them that turn aside. They'll not cleave to me. Flee youthful lust. Flee fornication. Every... The Bible reminds us in the book of Hebrews, marriage is an honorable thing, and the bad is undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Amen. And I've reminded this before, and I even hate to even, I hate to even give the challenge. But the most spiritual man in the Bible, David, fell morally with Bathsheba. 
strongest man known to mankind. He was known for his strength. What's his name? Fell morally. The wisest man, the most intelligent man that ever lived outside of our Lord Jesus. What's his name? And he had many wives, and they turned his heart away from the Lord. Let me just tell you, girls, guys, you want to you want to train wreck your future? You want to rob joy? You want to finish your course with misery and frustration? Continue to live in that kind of a lifestyle. Continue to play around with sin. Here's, here's something, just a reminder. You play with sin, sin will eventually start playing with you. You don't go for the juggler of sin, it's going to go for your juggler. And you can't handle immorality, I can't handle immorality. The greater people than you and I will ever dream about being have had a hard time with that. If you find yourself on the precipice of messing your life up with something that's so sick and foolish and wicked, if you find yourself texting people you shouldn't text and asking questions you shouldn't question, going to secret emails that, you, that your spouse or your family doesn't know about, entertaining things in the twilight of night you shouldn't think about, you shouldn't, you shouldn't focus on, looking at things you shouldn't look at, talking about things you shouldn't talk, listening and laughing at jokes you shouldn't laugh at. You want to train wreck joy for your future, you go right there. Immorality not only has the judgment of God, it, bring, it is the judgment of God. It not only complicates your life, it, bring, it is judgment itself. And whoso pleases the Lord shall escape immorality. And, and when it comes to immorality, here's what you need to do. You need to, number one, uh, grow more grass rather than try and kill in weeds. I want to go around and say, no, no, no. Grow grasses of holiness and purity. Grow a deep love with your spouse. Love her. Love him. Don't, don't be looking across the fence at anybody else. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Stay in the scriptures. Memorize scriptures that you can go to whenever you're tempted. If you've got a real problem that you know it's out of control, get some help. There are men on this platform, there are men, there are men in our ministry who could help you. Ma'am, there are some people that can help you. Immorality, homosexuality, bestiality, all that sick stuff, it needs to be dealt with because it will train wreck us and keep us from finishing our course with joy. And I can't keep you pure and you can't keep me pure. That's going to be our own job. If you're going to be pure, you're going to be pure because you decide I want to do that. And I think the best way to do it is, and I'm, I'm for anything you can do to protect yourself. I think it's very wise. But I think the best way to do it is to seek to please and know God. You stay close to God, you'll stay away from immorality. If you find sin, and Brother, Brother Judah said this the other day, there's two dangerous sins. And the sins we're getting used to, the sins that we just we, we tolerate in our life, that's dangerous. What was the other one? Do you remember? The sin we think we're getting by with. The sin that we, we, we have and we just like, we kind of used to like a pet, a pet tiger. Just some, someone you let, you let around your kids and all of a sudden your kid reached out to get something that's his food and they just, they kill him. Messing around with sin, sin we're getting used to. And then sin we think we're getting by with. You never get by. Sin's the world's greatest detective. It always gets its man. I'll not be the exception, you'll not be the exception. Be sure your sin will find you out. Finish your course with joy by sustaining a pure life. Say, Pastor, I am so sick of being single. It's so hard to live single and live pure in this wicked world. You can do it. I can do all things through. Christ has got to be bigger than, than your lust. It's going to be bigger than, he's going to have to occupy much more time. And we have beautiful singles who have just saved themselves in purity. They've had the same temptation everybody else has, but they've decided, I'm not going to, I'm not going to betray my God. I, I want to finish my course with, hey, the man who wrote this was single. Timothy may have been single. 
I think John the Beloved for sure was single. Jeremiah was single. Anna lived. She was 84 years old. She was married for a short time and became a widow as a young lady and lived single her entire life. Stayed pure to the Lord, ministered to the Lord in fasting and prayers. You can do whatever God wants you to do. Your joy in finishing is a big deal. I'll close with these two thoughts. Stimulate your passion. This will help us finish our course with joy. Be passionate, first of all, about the person of Christ. I love this church, and you should love this church, but our love, first of all, is to the Lord Jesus Christ. I love Linda with all my heart, but my first love should be to the Lord Jesus Christ. Love him. Stimulate a passion. Have you talked about him lately? If you could record my words and I could record your words of the last 24 hours, how many times did we mention Jesus? If we got all of our text messages together, all the texts that we text, all the texts you text and I text, we all put them together, how many times would the word Jesus have been text off your fingertips or Christ or Lord or God? How about the emails that we did this last week? Any time did we mention the Lord Jesus? Words that we speak? Maybe in private in our car when there's nobody here with us. How many times? Dear Lord, please help me with this. God, keep my heart sensitive. Lord, protect me from all evil. Jesus, thank you for saving my soul. We talk about things we love. That's why we sometimes don't talk about Christ. Passionate about Christ and his person. Passionate about your ministry. It's amazing. People just thrive at business. They thrive at their work. And they're casual with their ministry. I think if you've got two hours of soul winning and have a 160-hour week, man, you're killing me, man. You want me to go to Saturday soul winning meeting? Good night. i got a lot of things to do. Yeah, you're gonna, you need to evaluate. Get a checkup from the neck up. Evaluate. What are, you, what are you thinking? Is that work all that important? you got to work on Saturday? You can't go soul winning? Can't do a bus route? How many things we can't do? Stimulate a passion. Say, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Why did you leave me on the planet? What can I do? Stay passionate about your ministry. Keep drumming it up. Apostle Paul told Timothy, hey, neglect not the gift that's in you. What you got in you, use it. Don't neglect it. And listen, if we're just waiting for another message to stimulate us, all of us ought to be stimulated. Listen, if you live in a world that needs the gospel, it shouldn't be 17 messages for you to listen to, for you to get excited about telling someone about it. Hey, we're children of God. We got a gospel track. We got a friend day. We got an opportunity. It ought to be as natural as breathing. Stimulate a passion for a ministry. Stimulate a passion for your family. For family, the, work of, the people that, that live closest to you. Some of us were nicer to the stinking uh, mailman than we are to our own wife and husband. We're nicer to the people on the street we don't even know. Oh, hey, 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 get home. And we're, we're curt and sharp and frustrated with people. Love your family. Boys, girls, love your mom and dad. Obey your mom and dad. Love your kids. One of the things that blessed me about teen camp. And thank God for people that went to teen camp. Mamas, thank you for getting your dad, kids to there. Daddies, thank you for doing that. One of the young men, and it blessed my heart. He said, you know, I, I, I realized that, oh, you've got a good testimony in the community, but I don't have a good testimony in my own house. I don't have a good testimony at school. Went down and prayed and went back and got his sibling and said, hey, listen, come down. I want to tell you, I am sorry for being a lousy brother. I'm sorry for being a lousy sister. I'm sorry for being, trying to be all cool and not being a good brother or sister to you. It's a revival of being passionate about your ministry, about Christ, about your family. And then lastly, sustain strength through trials. You want to finish your course with joy? All of us got trials. All of us got difficulties. And God can help us through every one of them. Some of our sweet people in here tonight, they've heard the doctor say, you've got cancer. It doesn't look good. And you know, God's still giving them strength through that trials. Some of them have had a spouse leave them. Gone through the difficulties of divorce, single moms, single, single dads. Difficult situations. And you know what, God's got, he's got, he's going to allow father filtered things to come into my life and my future and in your future. 
decides, you know, Lord, I want you to strengthen me through these trials. Why? Because I want to finish my course with joy. I want you to finish your course with joy. I think it's inside of you too. Every young man, every young lady, every member of this church, if you're here tonight, I don't, I don't know anybody who would say, look, I just want to flop. That's what I want to do. I just want to, I want to bottom out. I can't wait for that to happen. Hopefully all of us would have something in our hearts that God, please, all of us, all the way. Make sure I'm one that finishes strong. I think one of the best things we can do when that happens is to go to the Lord and say, God, please help me. Not to bottom out, not to train wreck, but to finish my course with joy and the ministry that God has set before us. So stand together, can we please?